Chats. Uh, we're back. Um, Brian Hernandez, welcome to Live Chats with PMQ. Joined in the studio with the Doe Doctor, Mr. Tom Lehman. Um, he is a consultant for the pizza industry, um, and he's dedicated 47 years to the study of pizza. And he was briefly telling us his stories about visiting Geno's in Chicago um, while he was a member of the AIB when he first started out. And you said, "We." Uh we were all interested, and everybody on staff really liked the Geno's Pizza. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, uh, since my background is in food engineering, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'd go ahead and try to reverse engineer that product. And uh, well, within probably maybe a couple months, I had successfully reverse engineered it. But one of the things I found that when I was doing that, that everything that I knew about East Levin products, making breads and uh, buns and rolls and things, mm -hmm did not apply to pizza. Really? And I saw that there was a whole separate technology uh, needed to uh, to steer pizza. And that set me on a quest to identify what that technology really entailed. And it's taken me all these years to really <laughs> figure it out. And you might say unravel that DNA. So it really just uh, started out as just morbid curiosity on your part, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, we're just going to jump right into it. Um, apparently, we have uh, already got some questions. Actually, it came up before we even started. Uh, we have a question here from Noga in Ontario, Canada. And he says, greetings from Ontario, Canada. Tom, what is the difference of a crust after it's baked between the cold risen dough opened directly from the cooler and a dough ball that's been sitting at room temperature? What, can, what is the difference in the bake? between well, those two. It, 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 just in the bake alone, uh, dough that's directly out of the cooler, still cold, first of all, it's going to be more difficult to open up into a skin. Mm -hmm. And when it's more difficult to open up into a skin, you're going to have to work it more, you lose a lot of the shape on the product, uh, you tend to get more thin spots in it, right. which can come back to haunt us later on. <laughs> now let's fast forward to the baked product itself. That cold dough coming right out of the cooler, uh, we're going to find that almost every time it's going to bubble a whole lot more than one that's been allowed to warm up, not necessarily to room temperature, but to about 50, 55 degrees. That's all that you really need. So less bubbling, uh, more uniform cross-section across the bottom. And I might add that when you're having difficulty in opening it up, we tend to get more thin spots, especially if we're doing it by hand. Mm -hmm. If we're pressing it, that's different, or if we're using a, a dough roller, that's a whole different story. But for opening it by hand, we get those thin spots on the bottom. As a result, we tend to get a greater propensity for sogginess uh, on that bottom crust. Part of it might be firm, but when you hit that thin spot, uh, the dough itself uh, gets terribly soft. Everything above the dough is 90% water. Right. So you get some of that water on that very, very thin dough down there, and it just moves right down into the crust, makes it soggy. Creates the holes coming up. It just it destroys the whole bottom texture of the pizza. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the question, Noga. I hope this uh, was informative for you. Um, we do have another question here uh, from Mr. Mark Turner. Uh, he'd like to know what benefit do you get from adding semolina flour to your dough recipe? Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we studied that one at great length a number of years ago, and uh, if you put a little bit of semolina in. Uh, when I say a little bit, 25% uh, semolina flour into your regular doughs, uh, good things happen to it. Uh, you, you get a, a little improvement in flavor. Uh, you get a lot of improvement in crispiness. Uh, it, it's really nice. When you go up to 50%, you start getting into toughness. Mm. The, uh, the pizza, when it first comes out of the oven, if it's going to be used for dining in, isn't too bad. But it changes character tremendously when it starts going to carry out uh, and delivery, now it starts taking on uh, uh, closer affinity to names such as Goodyear, Goodrich, Uniroyal, Michelin. Mm. You see the characteristics there. Mm -hmm. We're talking about very tough, very chewy. <laughs> so my advice is if you're going to put semolina flour in, uh, keep it under 50%. Under 50. 25% is a good level. And be aware that when you put semolina flour in, it has a larger particle size, it's a coarser flour, and as a result, it's slower to hydrate. So 
when you have the semolina flour in your dough, it will tend to be a little bit more tacky mm -hmm. when it first comes off the mixer. That's normal. Don't worry about it. Don't go putting additional flour in thinking, oh, I've got too much water. Okay. That's, that's a good tip because a lot of people probably right off the bat, they put in that flour and it seems fine right then, but then it'll dry out later in the process. Exactly, okay. and then they'll wish they hadn't. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of, uh, you'd mentioned how it, it tends to not be as good when you're talking takeout and, and things like that. What is the best kind of dough um, for delivery and takeout? And I mean, is there a difference? Would you recommend uh, doing one for takeout and one for delivery? Or? No, uh, best kind of dough for takeout and delivery. Uh, the biggest problem that we have uh, with both of those is just lack of crispiness. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really tough, if not essentially impossible, to get a dough that's been baked fresh and then boxed, put into a moon bag for delivery, and then delivered to your house 20-30 minutes later and have it fresh, hot, and crispy. It'll be fresh, it'll be hot, but we lose the crispiness because within that bag uh, we created a steam chamber and you have to remember the very thing that makes that crust crispy is just the fact that that crust total moisture content is is down in the four to eight percent range mm -hmm. and the rest of it is up closer to fifty percent so moisture wants to move from areas of greater concentration to that of lesser concentration so it wants to move from the middle or the crumb portion into that crust and get soggy this happens with time if you've ever bought French bread, mm -hmm. French bread, you bring it home, it's crispy, it's crunchy. Mm -hmm. You put it in a plastic bag, and two hours later, it's like shoe leather. <laughs> and it's the same thing that happens to our pizza crust. Okay. Um, the biggest problem that, that we tend to see, though, is the, the, the crust itself becoming objectionably tough and chewy on delivery or carry out. Mm -hmm. And to address that, maybe the best thing to do there would be to use a lower protein flour. Okay. When we studied it, what we found was that we got a superior product for uh, takeout and delivery when we brought our flour protein down from 14 percent and we brought it down into the 12 percent range. So now all of a sudden we're not buying what we would call a pizza flour. Now we're looking at something that might be a strong bread or a roll pro flour. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a lower cost product for us and you may find that it's going to perform better in that it's not going to give you that extreme chewiness or toughness that we're accustomed to. Um, okay, um, I was just handed this. Apparently um, some people are having problems getting into the, the web chat. So feel free please to um, tweet us at PMQ Pizza Mag or you can hit us up on Facebook, PMQ Pizza Magazine, or send them directly to Melanie at PMQ.com and she will be able to give you uh, post questions for you. And uh, if there are any issues like that, just go ahead and let us know. Or go ahead and reach us in one of those fashions. So uh, thank you for that uh, update there. Uh, sorry if you've been trying in vain to reach us. We do apologize. Um, now getting back into that, that um, the, the toughness and chewiness, um, kind of on a parallel uh, avenue there is how, how do I get um, these are some questions that we received in email before the chat. So how do you get rid of the gum line in your pizza? It only appears about half the time. It's, you know, what's making that gum line and how do you just get it out of there? The, the gum line, uh, we like to refer to it as the dreaded gum line. <laughs> and it, it, the name is very appropriate. When you've got a gum line, it's, it can be very, very difficult to eliminate. And what we found was that there are a number of different things. There's really about eight or ten different things that, that can result in a gum line. And it's not until you address the one thing, or sometimes there could be more than one, uh, because they cascade. You've got to find the one thing that's causing the gum line and address that. The gum line will not go away until you do. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when, we, when we manage the dough, if the doughs come off too hot mm -hmm. and then we take the dough and we put it into a dough box and we fail to cross stack it, we just don't cross stack it, we nest them right away, put them into the cooler. Well, what happens now is that the dough balls all grow together and now rather than having six or eight individual dough balls in a box, we now have got one large dough piece in the box. Not a good situation. So knee-jerk reaction to that is 
well, we can fix that easy enough. We'll just start reducing the yeast level. Mm -hmm. So the yeast comes down, 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 until pretty soon, all of a sudden, the dough no longer rises as much. Uh, the bo dough balls look more normal. They open up better. They hold up absolutely great. That's the good news. Now we find that, oops, we've got a gum line. And why do we have a gum line? Because we've reduced the yeast level so low that we cannot develop enough pressure within that dough to lift it up or leaven it after we have put the weight of the topping ingredients mm. onto it. So now we have a very dense dough in the oven while it's trying to bake. And that when that heat goes to the bottom of the crust, it's very dense, the heat is conducted through the dough into the sauce and toppings up above it, where it's dissipated endlessly as steam. As a result, that dough never gets cooked properly on the bottom. Mm. And so what was the cause of it? Insufficient yeast. But why did we have insufficient yeast? Because our temperatures were too high and because we did not cross stack. Okay. So it can be a chain reaction. Uh, uh, and this is what makes it so dreaded because we have to find all of those and kind of almost investigate as to what's causing it. And you, you look at a dough, I've gotten to the point now where we kind of know what yeast level should be in a dough for the different types of yeast. And if we come across a very, very low yeast level, uh, an unusually low yeast level that just falls out of the norm, uh, we can normally trace it back to that. Okay. And that, and that was actually another question we had received about that is, uh, do you recommend nesting your dough in the walk-in or cross stacking? I know some people do the cross stacking, but you would highly recommend cross stacking it for an hour or two, depending uh, on the dough ball size? Absolutely, okay. depending upon the dough ball size. Um, Cross-stacking, I'm, I'm going to say, is absolutely mandatory. Okay. Um, the reason why is because the dough ball has heat in it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's heat when it comes off the mixer. Depending upon the type of uh, cooler we've got, if we've got a reach-in cooler, we like to see temperatures in the 70 to 75 degree range. Absolutely no more than 80 for a reach-in cooler. But if you've got a walk-in cooler, you can work very well within the 80 to 85 degree Fahrenheit range. And then we take the dough and we put it into the cooler and we cross stack it mm -hmm. and if it's 16 ounces or less two hours is good if it's over 16 ounces if it's 17 18 20 22 ounces go to three hours cross stack time okay and then after that it's what we call down stack where we take the top box we bring it down and build a new stack and each box then nests uh, in some coolers you may find that because of air circulation, uh, the dough may tend to crust over or skin. And if it does that, before you uh, build your stack as you're filling your dough boxes, simply take a, a, a brush and a little bit of oil. It doesn't have to be olive oil. It can be just plain canola oil or vegetable oil. And just paint the top of the dough balls lightly with a little bit of oil. What it will do is it'll seal the top of the dough ball and, and form a, a barrier that the moisture can't go through. So when it's sitting in the cooler, cross stack, you're not going to have a drying problem. Well, it, I mean, you're just kind of answering all the questions that, that have been sent to us in a <laughs> row, so that's perfect. Uh, yep, just how do I keep my uh, dough from drying out in the cooler? Simple as just putting some olive oil upon it. Okay. Or just salad oil. Salad oil, okay. Um, <clears throat> what is the difference between a spiral and a planetary mixer. Um, just I guess just the basic difference and then what is the difference on the quality of your dough if if any at all? Uh, spiral mixers kind of look like a large bowl with a corkscrew turning inside of it and uh, the thing to remember about a spiral mixer is that the the dough itself is in contact with the spiral and only a small portion of the of the bowl mm -hmm. and as a result of this you can have a lower horsepower uh, spiral mixer mixing a much larger dough than you can in a planetary mixer. Okay. Because with the planetary mixer you, you've got your your agitator going around in a planetary motion and that dough is always being brought into contact between the dough hook itself and the side of the bowl. Right. There's a huge amount of energy required to drive that through and so it tends to develop more friction during mixing mm -hmm. so the doughs actually tend to warm up a little bit more. Um, you, you've really got somewhat of a limitation on dough size when you're dealing with, with uh, planetary mixers. Uh, 
for us in the in the pizzeria industry, about the largest you're going to be dealing with uh, is going to be 80 quart. I do know they make they make 140 quart, and some stores will use that if you're large enough. But if if you can't find one of the 140 quart uh, Hobart planetary mixers, then simply turn to a, a spiral design mixer. Uh, they're easy to operate, uh, generally less horsepower, less current draw. Uh, they've got great capacity. Rule to remember about a spiral mixer is that it will mix down to about 25 percent of its stated capacity. So if it's, been, if it's got a capacity of 100 pounds of flour, it'll mix a dough based on 25 pounds of flour. Okay. So there's a lot of latitude in that, um, more so than you have in a planetary mixer. Most planetary mixers, uh, you can't get down into the 25% range. Um, the reason why is the dough just sits in the bottom of it, and the dough hook just barely touches the dough, kind of rolls it around, and it really doesn't work it like it should. So greater capacity range in a spiral mixer uh, than you do in a planetary. You can have a greater overall capacity in a spiral mixer than a planetary. However, the um, spiral mixer does have have some problems, and the biggest problem that it has is that it does not have an uh, accessory hub, which means that you can't put a pelican head on it, you, you can't grind, you can't shred, right. you can't slice, dice, and anything else that you want to do with it. It does one thing, but it does the one thing very well, <laughs> and that is it mixes dough. The planetary mixer, all of them do not have a, a um, an accessory hub on them, so keep that in mind. If you're looking for a mixer and it's a planetary, make sure if you want to do your cheese on it, make sure it has an accessory uh, hub on the front of the mixer. There are some that don't. The other thing is that your planetary mixer uh, with the agitators can have a whip, a wire whip, and it can also have what we call a flat beater. This is one that kind of looks like a fishbone. And so it's also good for making sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're blending your sauce, uh, it'll work just fine. A spiral mixer can't be used for that. Okay. So the, the planetary mixer is a, really a jack of all trades. It, it probably has a much wider application right. than, a, than a planetary but, or than a spiral mixer. But on, on the other hand, if your needs to mix dough are large, you've got to mix a lot of dough. Uh, probably your spiral design is going to be the preferred. Okay. So it really just depends on what you're trying to make and how much of it you're looking to make. Exactly. So. All right, great. Well, we have a, a tweet here from Dan Urbancic, I believe. Please don't hate me if I mispronounce that. I apologize, Dan. Um, and this kind of goes back to uh, in the cross stacking and the gum line. He's just wondering how often you experience that it is necessary to oil a skin to prevent gum line or if it could cause other negatives. I don't know of any uh, negatives from oiling the dough ball when we put it into the box. Uh, as far as drying out, uh, because of the fact that I've never seen a negative factor or feature to oiling the dough ball when it's in the box prior to taking it to the cooler, I, I've just done it automatically. I do it right up front all the time. Uh, there are times when you can have issues where you take the dough into the, into the cooler and one time you don't you don't get any crusting. Next time you do get crusting, mm. and it all has to do with where you place it in the cooler. Uh, you, you've got your condensers up in the in your cooler. Uh, you've got air blowing, and if you have a dedicated space in your cooler, then you may not have a problem. But if you just go into your cooler and place it anywhere, for example, back in the back of the cooler near your condensers, mm -hmm. uh, there's more airflow back there. Right. And now you're more prone to suffer from some crusting of the dough. Whereas if you put it up towards the front, closer to the door, there's less airflow there. So I like to say, just go ahead and lightly brush them with uh, salad oil and don't worry about it. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much for the question, Dan. Um, also, to remind everybody, you can reach us at, uh, uh, tweet us your questions at PMQ Pizza Mag and Facebook, or send them directly to Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E, at PMQ.com. So, um, I do have a good question here that I was just wondering. Um, for someone who's starting up, what is the best tip you can give them about developing their dough recipe for their pizzeria? Uh, I get I, I get so many people coming to me every year saying, Tom, 
I've got this great dough recipe and I've been making it now for a couple of years. I've really developed it, spent a lot of time on it. I give it to all my friends. I have these pizza parties and everybody is just so enthralled by it. And they've all said, gee, I ought to open up a pizzeria with, with this, <laughs> with this uh, type of crust. And can you help me with that? And automatically I, I say, absolutely, I can help you with it. Um, but let's just assume you want to be in business for five years. And let's assume you want to make oh, at least a half a million dollars a year in sales, uh, which is not a lot. So if we take five years, so five times a half a million, I tell people you need to have about two and a half million dollars in the bank. And then they say, for what? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Why would I need two and a half million dollars in the bank? And because all I heard you say was my dough, my dough, my pizza. And I never heard you say anything about your customer. So I have to assume that you're going to buy all of your pizzas. <laughs> and so here's, here's the point. You've got to develop your pizza, not for you. You don't have a vote in the matter. You've got to develop it for your customer. Your customer is the one that's going to buy it. Now, does that mean that you... Any concept that you've got, that you have to throw away? Absolutely not. You can take that concept and you can bring it to the table, but look at your customer, study your customer, find out what kind of pizzas are being sold in your marketing area. Even go so far as, as to talk to them, solicit these people, and hang around the mall. When somebody buys a pizza, walk up to them and say, excuse me, sir, uh, I noticed you just bought a slice of pizza. Uh, is that your favorite uh, type of pizza? and find out what really sells in that marketing area and then bring your concept with that but maybe massage it a little bit. Uh, i give you a good example. Uh, a friend of mine brought a New York style pizza uh, to my hometown which is Manhattan, Kansas and New York style pizzas are, are not especially crispy on the bottom. Right. They're softer, they're, they're chewy. Well that type of pizza is not received with open arms in Manhattan, Kansas. So we simply took that pizza and we massaged it a little bit, we changed it around and what we ended up with was the same thickness, the same visual presentation, the same toppings, it looks the same. The only difference is now we've got a crispy crust on the bottom and here's a young man who has uh, been in business for seven years uh, one of those years he was voted best pizza in Manhattan and uh, he now owns three stores. So there's a lot to be said about bringing your idea to the table but changing it or modifying it a little bit to meet your customers demands. Very, I mean just sage advice and almost common sense. Almost common sense. <laughs> um, I, uh, this is a follow up to Dan, uh, Dan's question a minute ago. Um, I did get his name right by the way. I'm gonna put that one in my win column but I did, I think, misinterpret his question. He was actually referring to the dough skin before making the pizza. Um, and if I don't hear anything from you, I think we'll, that means we'll have this question right. So I believe he's talking about once you get the skin slapped out, applying it to the to the bottom. Is there any negative effects? Um, is, how often do you experience it's necessary to put the olive oil on the, on the dough skin once it's opened up oh. to get rid of the gum line? And if there are negative effects to doing that. Yeah. Um. One of the things, again, I, I just do it automatically. Uh, it's my preference, but you have to approach this cautiously. One, for myself, I always like to put a little bit of olive oil on the dough skin after it's been opened up. And the reason why is it creates a, a moisture barrier between sauce, which is 90% water roughly, and, and my dough, which is down around 50, 55% water. And so, when that sauce, and it will separate with, with time, uh, when that moisture starts migrating down into the dough, uh, the stage is set for a gum line. Mm -hmm. So when I have a little bit of oil on that dough skin, and a very, very light amount of oil, if you get too carried away, what's going to happen is that you're going to take a bite out of the pizza, and as you pull it away, all the toppings are just going to slide <laughs> off. Not good. So very, very light. If you can see a shine on the surface, you have enough oil. Um, so if you do that you're going to be fine. In some applications uh, you may be in a situation where uh, here it is five o'clock and you know you're going to get slammed at six o'clock 
gee, wouldn't you like to be able to pre-prep some of your, your doughs? So you slap them open. Now is a good time to oil them, even if you don't normally oil them. Mm -hmm. I'd oil them at this time. Go ahead, sauce it, and maybe cheese it. So now you got sauce and cheese on it, and all you have to do is put the order toppings onto it, and you got a leg up over the saddle. So you, you can kind of pre-make those, but they're, they're going to sit for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. Some people will even put them into the cooler ready-made like that, and they can be managed for those slam periods much better. If you're doing a take-and-bake, Take and bake pizza. Uh, that pizza may set for 24 hours uh, after you prep the, the skin before it's going to be baked. You absolutely have to put the oil onto the dough skin. Otherwise, what you're going to end up with is something that looks like a piece of wet pasta <laughs> uh, underneath your toppings. It, it'll never bake out. All right. Uh, yeah. So, I, short answer is yes, it does help prevent the gum line. Absolutely does. Awesome. Um, just going to jump into this one really quick. Um, does New York water really make the best pizza? I can answer that in one word. No. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've been to so many places uh, that have made absolutely great, absolutely great New York pizza. Uh, case in point, the one that really drives it home, uh, PMQ at one time uh, did what we called the pizza cruise and my wife and I were on it and one of the stops was on the island of St. Thomas, and uh, there was a pizzeria, uh, Pizza Amore, hmm. that, that was the name of the place. It's right across the post office, from the post office there. If you're ever on St. Thomas, go, go visit them. The owner's name is John, I remember that. And he makes a New York style pizza that is absolutely fabulous. And you, I, I, had to ask him. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I had to ask him, John, where do you get your water from? And, you know, wouldn't have surprised me if he said, oh, I have a shipped in from New York in barrels or something. But he said, I just get it from the tap. <laughs> and I said, where does your tap water come from? And he said, well, he said, you have to realize that this is an island and we don't have any freshwater wells. So all of the water that they have there is what they call processed water. So it's rainwater that is collected and it's the, the, the city reprocesses that water, cleans it up, mm -hmm. and they turn it into potable water, put it in the tanks and send it on its way back to the stores and the homes and everybody who uses it. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. And everybody was in agreement. And we had people on that cruise from New York all over the <laughs> East Coast. And they're sitting there saying, I don't believe this. Uh, he's got a deck oven. He doesn't have a coal-fired oven. And he's making absolutely great pizzas. So do you need New York water to make a great pizza? Absolutely no. Now, I will say this, that water will and can impact your dough and your finished pizza. Uh, for example, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, uh, just south of Oklahoma City, historically has very, very soft water. Mm -hmm. As a result, uh, you don't have the dissolved minerals in that water, and the doughs tend to be softer and maybe a little bit weaker. So that could impact the way the dough handles, and it could impact maybe uh, the crispiness of it because the way you handle the dough can impact the crispiness of it, the way it stretches and opens up. On the other hand, um, other places, Chicago, Illinois, when we left Chicago, all the water came, uh, came out of deep wells, and it seems like most of Illinois is sitting on a, um, a limestone ledge, <laughs> and so yeah. there's a lot, of, a lot of dissolved calcium in the water there, so it was very hard. Today, that water is all processed by the city and it even sent out to the suburbs, so it's soft water. Okay. So, Hard water, soft water makes a difference. Uh, if it's if that water is from Utah, California, New York, it shouldn't make any difference at all. Perfect. So um, the myth has been busted, apparently. Thank yeah. you so much. Absolutely. I'll stand by that one. Okay. We uh, we had, do have a couple uh, questions here on making sauce. We could probably just address them in one question. How would you create a good sauce and what factors should be considered in, in making your sauce? What constitutes a good sauce? That's probably been one of the, um, I think that is the single most commonly asked 
question uh, that has been presented to me over about the last 14 to 18 months. Oh, good. I was going to say that's the other question. It's, so. it's a very, very common question. Um, and I always respond that, you know, we're making pizza sauce, not rocket fuel. And let's start <laughs> just by looking at a very basic sauce. Uh, take your dough skin, open it up, brush it with a little bit of oil. I like to use olive oil in that application. And if nothing else, if they're in season, if you got access to them, take garden fresh, ripe, emphasis on ripe tomatoes, slice them about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, and just pat them dry a little bit. I like to put them on a towel, mm -hmm. and so any excess moisture comes off. And just lay that over the surface of the pie of the dough skin. It makes an excellent sauce. Uh, but what about all the oregano and the basil and everything? Put that on on the side. Uh, you can slice basil or tear basil. You can put whole basil leaves on. Um, you can sprinkle basil on if you want in a dried form. I don't recommend that. And I'll explain it a little bit later here, but fresh basil works great. Mm -hmm. Garlic. You can slice your garlic. Uh, you can crush your garlic. You can dice your garlic. Uh, put that on the same way for your flavorings. No place at all that I have to stir a sauce. Now, let's say we can't get uh, fresh tomatoes. So now we can buy uh, whole tomatoes, canned tomatoes. I can buy tomato fillets. And I can drain these. I like to drain off not all of the juice, but most of it. And then just reach in and put all these big chunks of tomato mm -hmm. over the top of the pie you get all the visuals. The visuals are absolutely fantastic because now your customer can see chunks of tomato and when you bite into it you get that burst of tomato flavor yeah. and you don't have to worry about um, uh, your spice blend being wrong. What <laughs> spices have we added? If I do anything I might add a little bit of garlic to the uh, to the surface of the dough before I put my tomato product on. So again I'm not blending a, a, a sauce I'm just putting tomato product on. Uh, the next step, I could use crushed whole tomatoes, again, in exactly the same application, where open up my dough skin, paint it with a little bit of olive oil. If I want to put a little bit of garlic on, I can sp uh, spread some garlic on the surface, and then put a, I use a spoodle, which is a flat bottom ladle, and I portion out my sauce, put my sauce on, and then I spread it out over the surface of the dough skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do that. Still, at this point, I have not added any dried herbs or anything. Uh, moving on, let's take a lot of people who you like to use what I call a blended sauce. And you can use uh, fresh crushed tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use tomato sauce. I don't like to use tomato paste. Uh, it's, In my opinion, it's over-processed. Uh, it, it has no application on pizza, really. Uh, so either a prepared sauce, uh, crushed tomato, uh, ground whole tomato with or without seeds, with or without skins, uh, whatever you want to use. Um, if you want to use dried herbs in it, go ahead, use those. Uh, dried basil and dried oregano. Um, do not put garlic or onion into the sauce. Do not. Why is that? And the reason why is because there are enzymes present in uh, garlic and onion which will react with the pectins in the tomato to create tomato jelly. So your sauce will thicken up. And then what we do when we do that is we add cans of water to it. Mm. And yep. when we add cans of water to it, here we have all this fresh tomato. And now we're adding water to give it sp uh, spreading consistency. And we're just diluting out all that wonderful flavor. Right, right. And so sauce is about flavor. And we see a lot of people loading up the sauce, trying to get more sauce on it to get more flavor. And you don't need to do that if, if you just move towards a, a more particulate tomato product going on to your pie. You'd be surprised at how much flavor that will bring. And so that's, that's something that we really want to keep in mind. Um, and actually, um, along the lines of this, it's uh, thank you so much. We got another tweet from uh, Gaetano Guagliardo. Again, apologies if I did mispronounce it. Um, he says that when he makes pizzas with no sauce, just oil, pesto, or uh, white sauce, with a few ingredients and easy cheese, he gets huge bubbles in his crust, and he can't explain it, and he wants to know, can you? Um, 
Yeah, it's probably not, it's not what you're using for a sauce. It's not the pesto or, or the Alfredo or, uh, or the white sauce that you're using. My guess is it probably goes back to your dough. Uh, I, I'd really want to question you more about your dough. First of all, are you using it right out of the cooler? Mm -hmm. that, that is uh, a stage that is set for bubbles and blisters. Yeah, and Gaetano, be, feel free to retweet us the answer to that. Are you using it directly out of the cooler or... Yeah, or uh, room temperature, I guess. And then the next question is, uh, if you're if you're using what we call a cold fermentation process, uh, we make up the dough today. Uh, we we scale it, we ball it, we put it up into the dough boxes. Uh, we cross stack it, we down stack it, and then we leave it set overnight. That is that is the norm. Right. Uh, are you doing that, or are you leaving it set from maybe making it in the morning and using it that night? Uh, that's not enough fermentation on the dough. Uh, the other question is, are you um, possibly running your doughs too cold? Uh, I've come across people that have heard that, well, my doughs should be cold rather than hot. So they're running very, very cold doughs. Uh, when you run them through the cooler, they're so cold that they're not fermenting properly. And as a result, they don't have sufficient fermentation on them. Quick way to test that is leave your dough in the cooler for 48 or 72 hours. And now if you bring it out and process it normally, and if you don't have the blistering and bubbling, that's probably what the problem is. Okay. So, but again, take a look at your dough temperature. If I had to tell you one temperature that we could live with between a, a reach-in and a walk-in cooler, it probably would be 80 degrees. Something very, very close to that on either side should work for you. So it's hard to say, but I'm going to bet it's not it's not with the pesto, it's not with the white sauce. Uh, we're looking at a dough problem here. Okay, so uh, feel, as I said, Gaetano, feel free to tweet us again. Let us know if, uh, how you're using your dough and uh, if this was beneficial for you. Um, I do apologize for the issues with the shout box. Again, tweet you any questions at PMQ Pizza Mag. Post it on Facebook or email it to melanie at pmq.com. I did post that in the shout box so you can read it. Um, we did receive one from the shout box from TC, and he wants to know, have you heard anything about Kumaforni pizza ovens? No, I really haven't. <laughs> uh, answer that one real, real, real easy. No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, TC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to be able to say that I've been working with him for the last six weeks, but I can't. <laughs> um, now... This kind of goes along with uh, when you're using your dough. Do you recommend letting your dough bench rest for any amount of time? Because um, I know we're talking about cross stacking in the in yeah. your walk-in, but uh, do you leave it out before that to, to kind of rise? I don't or? like to. Uh, I know some people like to bulk ferment, which means that they'll, they'll mix the dough, they'll leave it sit in the bowl for a period of time, half an hour or an hour, then they'll take it to the bench, they'll scale it, they'll ball it and put it up. I don't like to do that. And I do not like to uh, take my dough boxes, build my dough boxes full of dough, mm -hmm. and leave it setting out of the cooler for half an hour or an hour uh, prior to putting it in the cooler. And it's not, you, you can manage the dough that way, it's totally possible. But where the problem is at is that if you're even a couple degrees off, maybe three degrees off, and very few of us can maintain our dough within a three degree target range. Uh, or three degree range of our target, uh, what happens is that dough is going to ferment more or less while it's sitting there waiting to go into the cooler, uh, which can totally disrupt dough performance, not one, not two, but maybe at three days or, uh, or keeping it into four days or even into five days. It can definitely impact the dough out at that range. Uh, the, mecha the mechanism here is that as that dough sets, it's beginning to ferment and you see those dough balls begin to grow, they'll get larger. As they're fermenting, they're becoming less dense. And being less dense, they are a better insulator. They are more difficult to cool. It's more difficult to extract that heat from that dough when it goes into the cooler. As a result, when it goes into the cooler, even though they're cross-stacked, we cannot cool them down fast enough. They continue to grow. Remember, yeast generates heat during fermentation. Mm -hmm. Just because we put it into the cooler does not mean that it stops fermenting right away. It, it will take hours before it stops. So it's generating its own heat, it's fermenting more and more. And you may have said at some time or seen at some time that uh, 
G. Every once in a while when we do that, the dough blows. And when it blows, what did you do? Oh, we just reduced the amount of yeast. And when we reduce the amount of yeast, now the dough doesn't blow. But now we don't have enough yeast to properly leaven the dough when it has the weight of all the topping ingredients on top of it. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the wonderful world of that dreaded gum line. <laughs> so we're back to square one on that gum line. And it's it's just because of the way we handled that dough or managed it. Okay. So we always have to keep track on that. Um, sorry, Gaetano. Um, he, apparently he went away when we answered his question. He got pulled away. Yes, Gaetano, to answer your second question, there will be a video of this presentation, and we will post it up on pmq.com slash webinar backslash. So uh, if you... <laughs> If you miss it at any point, um, that's where we will post the video after it's gone from pmq.com slash live. So uh, moving on, we did get another one from the shout box from Bruce Chittick. He, he wants to know, uh, which oven do you like the most, a deck or conveyor? And is one better depending on the application, take out or eat in? Uh, great question, great question. Uh, one of the biggest errors, let me just kind of back back into that one a little bit. One of the greatest errors that a lot of people, newbies, just entering into the, uh, the pizzeria business uh, uh, get into is one of the first pieces of equipment that they buy is an oven. And that should not be the first piece of equipment. That should possibly be the last piece of equipment. <laughs> and the reason why is because the oven has to tailor your pizza concept. And all ovens do not bake the same. All ovens do not give you the same type of end pizza. All ovens are not designed to do that. Uh, case in point, if your pizza has a lot of toppings, your claim to fame in your, in your city or your town is we are popular because we put more toppings on our pizza than anybody else. It's a heavily topped pizza. It has a very, very high perceived value mm -hmm. to the customer. They love it. The only thing they don't like about it is that it's kind of soggy once in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, to this point, um, there, there have been many different things that have been done to get rid of the sogginess. And uh, they're all Band-Aids. Uh, let's get to the root of the problem. You're releasing moisture onto the top of the pie. Your vegetables, again, are 90% water, roughly. And now, if you use an air impingement oven, this is where we're blowing a lot of air onto the top of the pie, I can adjust my fingers so I can blow enough air across the top of that pie during the baking time, just like a hair dryer. And it works exactly the same principle. Heated air at a high velocity, striking the top of that pizza, it actually causes the water to dis displace, creates like a wave system uh, on the top of the pizza, increases the surface area of that moisture on the top of the pizza, mm -hmm. increases the rate of evaporation right. at a tremendous rate. So you can really dry off that pie uh, going through the oven. It won't scorch it, but you can dry it out very, very nicely. In a deck oven, you don't have the opportunity to to redirect air onto the top of the pie to dry it out. So if your pie is more traditional uh, or with lesser toppings on it, more of a uh, margarita, uh, uh, Neapolitan, uh, gourmet, if you will, uh, then a deck oven or a wood-fired oven is absolutely great. Uh, but you, you've got to look at what your oven is going to do. Is it just going to bake a pizza? or does it also have to dry the toppings out? And so that's the first step. Next step is, tell me about your concept. Mm -hmm. uh, if your concept is, we're going to be fine dining, um, I've got no problem with an air impingement oven in a fine dining establishment, but if your customers are going to be sitting there and you're going to try to ooh and ah your customers watching an air impingement oven <laughs> where pizzas are put in on one side and come out the other side, there aren't going to be too many oohs and ahs. No. On the other hand, if you have a deck oven uh, or one of the wood fired ovens or combination fired ovens like that, uh, where you're going to be opening them up by hand, tossing them a little bit, uh, putting them on a make peel, peeling them into the oven, peeling them out of the oven, now we have something uh, that your customer can watch 
and there's some excitement in that. That makes them feel that this pizza was handmade just for me. And so it would fit that concept better. On the other hand, let's back up again. If you're located right across the street from a high school and you say, my forte is going to be uh, pizza slices and the faster I can make them, the, the better I'm going to be because they can sell more to the kids during that hour or something that they're going to be there. Uh, probably a, a, a wood burning oven, uh, a deck oven may not be in your future. Right. You're going to be much better served with one of the air impingement ovens. So it's less about um, eating or takeout, it's more about the style of pizzas you're making and your concept yeah, and, and volume, really. And, and when we get into uh, takeout, takeout and delivery mm -hmm. versus Delco versus dine-in, let me just simply say this, that moisture is the enemy on Delco, delivery carryout. Moisture is our enemy. Right. And so my feeling is that I can make a better pizza for Delco using an air impingement oven than I can a deck oven. Right. And if moisture is not a problem for you, uh, if you're making more of a Neapolitan pizza, then a deck oven is, it's moot as to whether an air impingement oven is going to be a better oven for you. Okay. But definitely if, you, if moisture management is going to be your challenge, then there's very little that's going to beat an air impingement oven. Perfect. Um, thanks so much for the question, Bruce. Uh, along the, the same lines right there, we received an email question from Tim. Uh, he has he wants a crispier crust and he has a conveyor oven. He wants to know, does, should he lower the temperature uh, and lower the bake time or raise the temperature and speed up the time um, or any combination? Currently, he has his oven set at 475 and the, excuse me, the bake time is 6 minutes 45 seconds. So okay. what would you recommend for a crispier crust? For a crispier crust, uh, I did a lot of work uh, at trying to develop, we call it a hearth bake characteristic, and uh, a lot of work had been done previous to, to my investigations at bake times and uh, baking platforms. Baking platforms are screens and pans and stuff like that, and we could never get the crispiness that we were looking for with what we had available to us at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I worked hand in hand with a pan manufacturer and I developed a, a new pan uh, and it comes from uh, Lloyd Pans. They're the pan manufacturer that I worked with and we developed what we call the hearth bake disc. And the hearth bake disc is, think of it as a flat disc and it's got holes in it, but the holes are very strategically placed and shaped and there's a ring around the outer edge and it varies with the size of the pan. And all of this is integral to what we're going to do because what we're going to do is we're going to put, depending upon your oven, if you have a new generation air impingement oven, uh, this would be one that was purchased probably, purchased new within the last seven years. And it sounds like you may have one because you're baking at 475. The older ones were typically down around 450, 440. So you may have a newer generation oven. Um, what we're going to do is we crank our temperature up close to 500 degrees. Remove any sugar from your formula. If you've got sugar, eggs, or milk in your dough formula, take them out. Remove it completely. <laughs> you don't need it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bake on this hearth bake disc. And when you bake on that hearth bake disc, that rim that has no holes in it at all, that protects the edge from getting overdone in view of the fact that we're up around 500 degrees. Our baking time is going to be between four and three quarters and five and a half minutes. Five and a half would be considered the outside. Okay. And the reason why we have these strategically located holes on the bottom is because where those holes are at, we get a slight blistering or bubbling effect and which kind of emulates what we get out of a deck oven. So we get a drier pizza coming out of the air impingement oven. We get very high temperature to the bottom. We get a, a great crisp on the bottom of it. And we also get these bubbles, which when you bite into those areas, you get kind of a crackle and mm -hmm. because it's a drier area. So it would probably give you the best option of getting a crispier product. Uh, through an air impingement oven. If you don't want to go with that whole process, 
uh, simply slowing down your oven and dropping the temperature is going to give you a drier product. Now, remember it's air impingement, so you're exposed to that airflow for a longer time, even though at a lower temperature, you may find that you need to go back and reprofile the top of your oven. Let, give me, let me give you an example. If we go to a seven and a half minute bake at maybe 440 degrees Fahrenheit, we get a better bottom bake on the crust. But at the same time, you're going, to, you're going to say, I'm now scorching my vegetables on top, or I'm burning my cheese or getting too much cheese color. Uh, the way to address that then would be to go back to your oven manufacturer and get a, one of the fingers for the top of your oven that flows less air. And that's probably going to be installed uh, probably towards the end of the oven, not towards the, ex the entry end, but towards the exit end that would be the proper place to place it. And that should control that top color. Okay. So there are several options that he can do. And as I said, um, we are gonna put this on pmq.com slash webinar when we're done. Um, and you can go back and review his answers again to kind of give you a hand there. Um, so I really do appreciate that question, Tim. Um, we do have, um, real quick, let me see. This is from another Tim thank you <laughs> Timbo 1710 an email question and um, what is a good temperature of water used in the mix and honestly how important is water temperature I'm pretty sure it's very very important <laughs> yeah uh, rather than a uh, Tim rather than a specific temperature water temperature itself is important because it's water temperature that we use to control our finished dough temperature uh, that is the critical temperature that we deal with uh, I like to say we use whatever water temperature we need to give us a finished dough temperature that is one, within the target range that we're looking for, two, that is consistent. Uh, if you do not have consistent temperature, you do not have effective dough management. So uh, if you're going to be targeting for 75 degree doughs or 80 or 85 degree doughs, they've got to be consistent, they've got to be constant day in and day out whatever water temperature it takes to do that, so be it. So shoot for that finished dough temperature, adjust your water temperature accordingly. Um, if I had to give you a number, I don't want to send you away without, a, <laughs> without an answer here, but Tim, what I would recommend for a single dough temperature that we could probably live with in most applications, it would be 65 degree Fahrenheit, assuming that you're using a planetary mixer. Okay, so <laughs> I was getting ready to ask. Let's just give him something. What is that kind of your average temperature that you use it's, in most of your recipes? It's, it's a pretty average temperature. Okay. Yeah, you know, un unless you happen to be located in Nome, Alaska, it's winter time, <laughs> and your heating system has failed. Uh, Sixty-five is probably going to be pretty close to getting you into the ballpark. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, can you tell us just real quick? Um, I know we were talking earlier about the. the the pretzel crust and I think it's kind of hit its peak and maybe on the downside. What are, what are some of the other trends you've uh, come across uh, just this year, in fact, or what do you see upcoming in the future? Uh, the, the biggest trends that I see coming along in the future uh, are really not so much crust except that there, there is a decided uh, preference, consumer preference, for thinner and crispier. And mm -hmm. if, I, if I had to use three words Thinner, crispier, faster, <laughs> and those seem to be the buzzwords today. That's what everybody's looking for. Um, so we want a thin crust, we want a, a crispy crust, and we want it in our hands faster. Uh, not all of those are always compatible with each other, but uh, that is the direction that we're going. Now, with that said, as far as the type of pizza, that we're seeing made. What what sells pizza today? What's the driving force behind it? And the best way to describe that is to say words like organic, natural, locally grown. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things that the consumer embraces. Mm -hmm. it, it makes them feel good. And so if you say, uh, and you don't have to say uh, or, organic pizza. 
uh, all you need to do is use a little bit of that and simply say that uh, all of our pizzas are made with organic flour. Uh, that I refer to it as redeeming social value. I may not think that pizza is the healthiest food. I'm not saying it isn't. But I, I'm just saying in the consumer's mind, they're thinking, well, pizza is not the healthiest food. So I'm not going to buy it. But if it's made with organic flour, I might buy it. Right. And mission accomplished. I've, I've sold it to somebody who maybe would have shied away from it. You can also increase your price point on, on things like using those buzz, buzzwords of like you, organic, local. Yeah, you might, you might also be able to increase your price point. Um, so or, organic, natural, yeah. uh, and you can source out. There's pretty good sources of these ingredients now. Uh, just go to some place like Whole Foods and you're going to see a lot of those. I know just going to our own local supermarket five years ago, uh, my arms could probably span the entire area <laughs> that, that was organic. Right, uh, right. Today, uh, it's almost the same length as the regular produce aisle. So it, it's growing in, in huge leaps and bounds. There's another thing that you can do too, and that is in the summer months when uh, gardens are in season, depending upon where you're located, uh, is buy from the local farmer's market. Uh, you might be able to buy fresh, ripe tomatoes and do a special. Uh, during the summer months while tomatoes are in season, uh, we are pleased to offer uh, delicious, fresh sliced whole tomato as a topping on our pizza. Uh, to bring people in. Very good. Uh, you, you might be able to do something on a Monday night where we're going to do uh, locally, locally grown uh, toppings on all of our pizzas every Monday night. Uh, I, I normally may not have come in on a Monday night, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden now I, I'm going to use an organic uh, whole wheat flour and I'm going to have locally grown tomatoes I'm going to have maybe an organic cheese, which is readily available, and all of my other toppings are either going to be organic or locally uh, procured. And that is just Monday night, no other night of the week, just Monday night. And if that will bring in additional customers, that's good for me. <laughs> Definitely. Um, real quick, we're going to wrap this up here. We started a few minutes late due to a technical issue. Um, I have one question left for you. Um, and please feel free if we don't get to your questions or you have some, go ahead and tweet them to us. Uh, post them on Facebook at PMQ uh, or PMQ Pizza Magazine on Facebook. Uh, and we can, you can either send them to Brian at PMQ.com or Melanie at PMQ.com and we'll make sure they get into the hands of the dough doctor. So on, I'm just on wrapping this up here real quick. What is the best way to reheat your pizza? Uh, best way to reheat your pizza. Um, one, of very, one very effective way is to use a deck oven. Uh, the toppings are, are typically the, the most difficult to, to reheat thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to say that I can take an air impingement oven and I can reconfigure the fingers on it uh, at some cost. Uh, the, the fingers sell for 90 to 100 and some odd dollars a piece. So I would have to change out the bottom fingers, and what I would do there is almost close off the bottom fingers completely and bring all my heat to the top of the pizza. I can then take a, a par-baked pizza, a ready, completely baked pizza, run it through the oven. It will refreshen the top. It will dry off any moisture. It will thoroughly heat the top. It will heat the bottom to the point where it's fresh, it's hot, it's crispy. That is the best. Everybody's not going to run out and do that with an air impingement oven. Oh no! You may not have the uh, the space even to do that. Well, so, what what would you do? What does Tom Lehman do at his house? Do you go microwave or do you put it in your oven? Never microwave. Okay. Uh, if, uh, unless you're a real glutton for punish, but don't microwave. Okay. <laughs> uh, but if I had to do anything else, like I say, it would be a, a deck oven in a pizzeria for reheating. Uh, just put it in. Don't don't put it in at 600 degrees. Uh, get your temperature down around 400 degrees, which will allow time for the toppings to heat up while not scorching the bottom. Okay. If I'm doing it in the home, I like to use a pizza stone. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a rural area, there's something to kind of keep in mind. If you're located in a rural area, uh, which we have a lot of that in Kansas, uh, I will sell partially baked pizzas, or I'll sell a whole baked pizza, but I will also 
give them a free pizza stone. Hmm. And you say, well, how do you give them a free pizza stone? And here's how you can do it. Go out and buy a pizza stone, and let's just simply say your price is $10. I will sell you a pizza stone for $10. But when I do, I will put your name and address into my POS system. Mm -hmm. And every time that you come back to me for the next 10, 10 times, I will give you a dollar. Or the next five times, I'll give you $2 off on any size pizza that you want to buy. And that's not for dining. That's for uh, carryout. So they're going to take out a pizza. They're going to take it home. They've got a pizza stone. They're going to come back mm -hmm. at least five or ten times to get the full value of, of that deal that I'm giving them. So now the, the stone didn't cost them anything because they got the money off. And they've got a mechanism by which they can actually take that pizza and recon it, reheat it, until it's almost as good as it came out of the pizzeria. That's that's actually a great tip right there. So boils down to pizza stone. That's the way Tom likes to do it. So yep. um, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Bruce Chittick wants to uh, thank you for all the great answers, Tom, and he says he Me hopes too. you are enjoying your semi-retirement. <laughs> uh, emphasis on semi. <laughs> emphasis on semi. I'm having a great time. Uh, love it. Okay, and also uh, Timbo1710 uh, would like to know, if they can contact you for consulting. So let's let everybody know how to reach uh, the Doe Doctor if they have questions or need some consulting. Absolutely. Anytime I can help anybody either answer questions or uh, you're up against the problem you, you, you can't get around or if you need help uh, through consulting, uh, you can contact me at the Doe Doctor at hotmail.com. Okay. And that'll go straight into my office at home. Um, they're just not wanting to let us go here. Bill just joined the conversation, and I had this question for you earlier, and we could just put it out there real quick. Um, what's a better choice for yeast, IDY or ADY? IDY. IDY. And, and the reason why is because I can add IDY, instant dry yeast. I can add that directly to the flour. If I use ADY, active dry yeast, I have to take that and put it into 100 to 105 degree water, mm -hmm. and I have to leave that set and hydrate uh, for about 10 minutes, stirring it once in a while, then adding that back uh, to my dough. And therein lies the problem because you have to have a thermometer with that water to make sure it's at the right temperature. Uh, depending upon who's going to be hydrating that yeast, it may be 100, and, it may be 90 degrees, or it may be 125 degrees. Uh, it's a variable, mm -hmm. and I like I like to keep my life as simple as possible. I'll do everything I can to keep your life simple too, <laughs> and so I'm going to recommend that you use instant dry yeast IDY. Open up the bag, portion out what you need, however number of ounces you need in your dough, and all you do is just pour it right on top of the flour. With that said, let me give you one little tip for the day before we close out here, Brian, and that is when you're making a dough, first ingredient to go in the bowl. Put your water in first. After you put your water in first, then add, if you're using salt and sugar, put both of those in. If you're just using either one, put that in. Do not, I repeat, do not stir it, whip it, or agitate it in any way. It's not necessary. You've got better things to do with your time. <laughs> do not put the oil in. Next ingredient to go in is going to be flour. So water, salt and or sugar, then flour. and. Start mixing. We're going to mix it for between a minute and a half and two minutes. Mix it just long enough until you don't see any more dry white flour. Is that the is the yeast go on top of the flour? The yeast goes right on top of that flour. Yep. Okay. And it'll be dispersed. You don't have to stir it in. It'll disperse through with your agitator. As soon as all that dry flour has been hydrated, and you'll see it because it'll start coming together, pour the oil in. Just pour it right into it. Mix it for two more minutes. And then change, I like to change it up one speed if my mixer will tolerate that. So if I got a four speed mixer, I'm probably going to be doing most of my first speed mixing on first speed, and then I'll finish it off at second speed. If you got a three speed mixer, depending upon which one you've got, you may be doing all of your mixing in low speed in first. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but whatever you're mixing your dough at right now, that's where you want to continue mixing. So water, salt and or sugar, flour, yeast on top of that, mix it for two minutes, add the oil, mix it for two more minutes, 
and then continue mixing as you normally do with your mixer and mixing time is going to be about eight to ten minutes you're probably going to see that that dough is going to mix more thoroughly and it's definitely going to mix faster and you're going to get, have a better incorporation of ingredients perfect and one tip he did show me which i love is everybody tends to kind of have a war with their dough when they're trying to get it out of the of the mixing bowl um, just add the smallest amount of oil to the bottom when it's done mixing and it'll fall right out yeah just no yeah. work when you're when you're all through mixing just put the mixer on low speed for a couple seconds and as it's just barely tumbling around in the bowl barely turning uh, just pour maybe an ounce yeah. is all you need right down the side of the bowl that's the key down the side and it'll coat the dough ball pull the ad drop the bowl pull the agitator out and the dough will all but jump out of the bowl on its own. <laughs> no more back breaking, scraping and tugging and pulling on that dough. I love it. So I'm, I'm actually glad we kind of got to a little dough recipe there for them. So uh, once again, thanks everybody for joining us here at the Live Chats with PMQ. Um, great participation from everyone. If you want to check out the video of this presentation, we, we will be putting it up on pmq.com slash webinar. Um, that's where it shall be housed for all eternity. <laughs> and Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. It's been um, a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, try to take it easy. Enjoy some retirement. <laughs> so once again, thank you guys for joining us, and we'll catch you next time on Live Chats with PMQ. Stay cool. <laughs>